it's my pleasure to welcome you, Judy, here today. Um, Judy Kim is an internationally well-known and award-winning video retinal specialist. Um, she's a graduate um, of Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and a Howard Hughes Medical Institute, National Institutes of Health Research Scholar. Uh, she completed her ophthalmology residency at Baskin Palmer and a vitreoretinal retinal fellowship at the Medical College of Wisconsin, where she works today. Um, she's a professor, a tenure track professor there of ophthalmology and visual sciences, and um, also biomedical sciences as well. And she's director of the teleophthalmology and research at the Medical College of Wisconsin. She's held leadership positions in numerous committees of major ophthalmology organizations and currently on the board of the American Academy of Ophthalmology, American Society of Retina Specialists, Macula Society, Diabetic Retinopathy Clinical Research Network, and the National Eye Health Education Group of, national, of the National Institutes of Health. She serves on many editorial boards, including JAMA Ophthalmology, and she'll be the only, only the second woman to serve as the president of ASRS and is currently the chair of the Women in Retina um, Committee. Dr. Kim has received numerous awards and honors, especially for her clinical excellence, leadership, and service to the organizations. She's published over 200 papers and given over 400 presentations, and including over 150 invited national and international presentations and named lectures. She's been actively involved with new, numerous multi-center clinical trials and served as vice chair of the DCR um, net, in which she currently serves as a national study for chair for protocol AE. In addition to diabetic retinopathy and age-related macular degeneration, uh, she's a world-renowned surgeon, and her research interests include surgical retina, telemedicine, ocular imaging, and community engagement. She's a true leader in our field, and it's an honor to welcome you here today as our visiting professor. As I said, Judy will be giving two talks today, the first one on home OCT, personalized medicine for the future, and the second one, lessons from post-op imaging of macular holes and ERM. Judy, welcome. Thank you, David. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, great to be part of this family. <laughs> Let's see, uh, where's my talk? Let's go there. All right. So I am just truly honored uh, to have been invited to speak to all of you today. Um, I gave uh, Steve uh, a number of topics for today's talk, and uh, uh, you folks chose two topics, <laughs> wanted to hear two topics. So uh, I will try to cover both uh, with a question and answer um, after the first talk. Um, I wish we were meeting in person, um, given how uh, wonderful you, your uh, program is, but uh, Given the pandemic, this is the best that we can do uh, and we'll make the most of it. Um, I was excited to um, meet you uh, all also um, because of um, my interest in adaptive optics. But in addition, um, I was um, also um, uh, hoping to um, meet when, when, I, when I would be uh, visiting. Um, Mina, but as you know, um, she uh, is um, no longer with us. Um, can I uh, advance this slide here? There we go. Um, so, um, the, Sunir Garg, the editor of Retina Times of SRS, um, and um, David and I had uh, an opportunity to uh, submit a um, memorial uh, for um, Mina. Um, we don't do this very often at ASRS, but Mina was special. And I think that attests to how important um, she was to the retina community. Um, she uh, was vice chair of uh, Women in Retina, um, which is part of uh, ASRS. And I served as I, I served as a chair, as David mentioned. So uh, she and I worked uh, on a number of projects over many years together uh, on mentoring the next generation of uh, retina specialists. Um, and um, also given our mutual interest in uh, imaging, adaptive optics, we had great discussions as well. Um, and um, um, I, she was just brilliant, fierce, kind, down to earth, and was a great teacher, scientist, physician, and a friend to many of us. And I especially appreciated the uh, virtual memorial that you all held in her honor on her birthday. 
um, it was totally great that the Flaum Institute did such a wonderful job of celebrating one of um, its own. And uh, David, you just give a, just a, such a heartfelt um, tribute there. Um, I, I will still remember that. So um, we are all blessed to have known Nina. Um, and it's great that you all are uh, established and uh, endowed share as well. And uh, she'll totally be missed. Here are my disclosures um, of these. Um, note that I am uh, on the uh, advisory board of Nodal Vision and uh, Notel research support has been gotten. And the Notel Home OCT is currently an investigational device. And uh, I would like to thank my collaborating sites around the world um, who have contributed to some of the study here. To begin, uh, wet AMD or exudative AMD or neovascular AMD um, uh, therapy is currently OCT guided. We uh, talked about it a little bit uh, in our uh, previous discussion. So we look for fluid in the retina, under the retina and even under the RPE and we start the uh, treatment. And then um, we hope to get to the dry state. And then uh, we start the uh, maintenance therapy. Um, most of us do the treat and extend, uh, but uh, one can do uh, monthly monitoring with PRN injection. The problem is that our elderly patients usually have to get a ride from someone, either their children or neighbors or beg and borrow and get a ride to our clinic. And then they wait to get an OCT since our treatment is OCT guided. And then they wait to see us again to uh, decide whether they get treated or uh, they get treated and decide how long the intro treatment interval should be or which drug, as we talked about before, uh, should be given or any switch therapy needs to be done. And then the patients go home and this vicious cycle repeats all over again. And not only is it um, um, uh, hard on the patients, um, during this COVID era, this, this pandemic era, it's even um, maybe even risky or dangerous. Many of uh, patients may be uh, uh, not willing to come to the eye clinic, uh, fear of uh, catching COVID. Uh, uh, so uh, some people may be declining or canceling or not keeping the appointment, which then ends up with a very bad outcome in some cases. Not only that practical aspect, but also uh, biologically, um, we've seen that not all patients uh, behave the same. Uh, in the uh, Harbor uh, study uh, uh, with the uh, ranibizumab in the as needed arm, um, there were some patients who just needed three injections, the mandatory uh, needed uh, for um, uh, the two year study, uh, and there are others who needed 24 injections, meaning needing one every four weeks. The median was 14 injections over two years. But as you can see, there is pretty much a, a, a even distribution. So when you first see Mrs. Jones on a first day, you don't know whether she's gonna uh, uh, end up in the fewer injection group or um, many injection group. We just don't have that. So we sort of guesstimate uh, by trying to do a, um, a treat and extend and find what that happy medium might be. So there is quite a bit of a room need for the personalizing our wet AMD management, uh, trying to decide who can be treated when and how often, how, who's going to need more treatment, other, others might not need as much, and how long should the uh, treatment go on, um, depending on the condition, but uh, macular degeneration with uh, um, uh, wet AMD, they tend to require chronic uh, treatment in uh, the majority of patients, although some can be stopped. Um, and I sort of joke with my patients when they ask me, you know, how long will this injection go on uh, with you? And I say, well, it's either you die or me die, whichever comes first that the injection with me will stop. Um, I mean, it basically tells you how chronic this treatment may go on. So perhaps we can use uh, artificial assisted um, uh, patient operated home OCT to help us to personalize the uh, management. 
So Notel um, uh, has devised this uh, portable self-operated uh, uh, SDOCT that takes three millimeter by three millimeter, the central 10 degrees of the macula images, 88 B scans per eye. Um, and then the, these uh, images are then uploaded um, to the cloud. In my opinion, uh, there are four requirements um, for a successful uh, home OCT. Um, and we'll go over briefly each one of these. First, the uh, OCT device that's self-operated by elderly patients at home. In order to uh, uh, try to uh, um, um, assess this, we uh, compared Notal uh, OCT device with the images from commercial o OCT device in the office. Um, it was a prospective clinical trial, consecutive eyes uh, with dry and wet AMD. Uh, uh, vision had to be 2400 or better. Uh, patients came, uh, subjects came in, they were not dilated and got imaged by either the uh, Cirrus um, uh, or the uh, Heidelberg Spectralis um, um, uh, machine by the photographer. And then they got a two minute video tutorial. Um, and then the patients start to image themselves. They self-operated uh, the Notal Home OCT to capture their images. And then the images from the uh, commercial OCT was then compared with uh, Notal OCT by a masked reader for presence or absence of uh, fluid. So uh, this is uh, baseline demographics. Um, and uh, as you can see, the vision was 2100 or worse in about 20% of the uh, uh, patients. Uh, and out of the 196 patients who are in the study, 90% uh, of the patients were able to image at least one of the two eyes, if not both eyes. Also, we asked about the, their experience. How was it? How easy was it to uh, take the uh, pictures and how good was the tutorial, et cetera? Uh, and what we found was that over 90% agreed or strongly agreed that it was quite easy and quick and comfortable. And as far as the image comparison between the uh, Notel OCT and commercial OCT, there uh, were 309 eyes that had both um, imaging. And here is uh, the finding uh, using commercial OCT as the gold standard, we found um, uh, high uh, sensitivity and uh, um, uh, specificity uh, with 91.5% sensitivity and 97% uh, specificity uh, with the uh, Notal Home OCT image. So what do the images look like? So on the left, you see an image of a patient, uh, one scan um, that shows subretinal fluid. Same area scanned with Heidelberg Spectralis um, show, um, uh, is shown on the right. Uh, and as you uh, um, know, Heidelberg averages images. Um, you can decide how many images can be, uh, should be averaged, but uh, it averages images. So the image tends to be um, nicer uh, with Heidelberg, uh, but at least within that uh, 10 degree uh, area, uh, you could see that there is fluid. Um, how about a, a comparison against Zeiss Cirrus, um, uh, uh, shown on the right. Uh, again, um, there is a slightly, I, I would think better image with the commercial uh, OCT, but uh, Notal uh, OCT image is not bad either. And uh, it does show um, some hyperreflective foci in the uh, retina, subretinal fluid, uh, subretinal thickening, hyperreflectivity there. So uh, I think you know you could get most of the information that is needed. So to summarize this uh, first point. Um, we found uh, that 90% of patients can successfully uh, self-operate the home OCT and capture gradable image um, of their macula in at least one eye. And um, over 90% of patients found uh, uh, the uh, imaging process to be a positive experience. 
and um, uh, there was a 91.5% sensitivity and 97% specificity in fluid detection when comparing uh, no home OCT image to the uh, commercial in-office OCT. The second uh, important criterion uh, is um, automated analysis of the daily output of images with high accuracy. Remember that um, there are 88 uh, B scans per eye times two in a patient, and then you get lots of patients over time. So you, you, you got you know gazillion images that you're going to have to be, uh, be looking through, and this is where artificial intelligence based algorithm could help us. So NOAA or Notal OCT analyzer was developed to not only detect fluid but also to quantify the fluid in exudative AMD. And uh, uh, we will show that it can be followed over time. The interesting thing is this algorithm uh, was validated not only for the Notal Home OCT device, but it also works for Cirrus as well as Spectralis. Um, so the, the images from Notal um, machine gets uploaded via cloud using the algorithm. There is an initial um, segmentation uh, of the B scan um, and then um, uh, another um, uh, processing is done where we try to detect presence or absence of fluid uh, and where in the uh, retina, in the retina or under the retina and also uh, the amount of fluid and then the output to uh, the physician will be uh, seen on the right uh, where we, you can see the fluid status report, you could see the thickness map, and you can see the volume uh, graph. And um, here uh, is um, another example. Uh, uh, on the left, you see the B scan and then the fluid overlay done uh, where the uh, dark red will be the intraretinal fluid and uh, lavender or orangish uh, lighter red is the uh, subretinal fluid. And then you can see on the right, uh, the images uh, of fluid location distribution in um, um, relation to the central one millimeter and three millimeter circle. And also whether it's in the retina or under the retina as well as volume uh, quantified in nanoliter scale. So we're now seeing things that are uh, uh, sometimes even hard to see with our naked eye. Well, we wanted to evaluate this uh, uh, algorithm um, um, and uh, developed a training and validation data, data set um, with images obtained from our five uh, study clinics. Um, out of the 88 B scans um, that are generated from each volume scan, uh, we manually segmented an average of 10 B scans that were uh, randomly selected. And each uh, B scan um, uh, was then labeled and then uh, they were split into a, a, a learning set and then validation set in a ratio of eight to one. So the training and validation for segmentation, we had 350 I, five eyes from 239 subjects um, and uh, 3,428 B scans were manually segmented. Of these, 75% actually had fluid. For the uh, uh, training and validation data set generation for classification of fluid, um, we used 553 eyes from 312 subjects. Um, so what did we find with using human grader as the gold standard? How did NOAA perform? Uh, we found that uh, there was a 0.99 sensitivity um, uh, for both subretinal fluid and intraretinal fluid detection and 0.98 and 0.97 um, specificity uh, respectively for subretinal fluid and intraretinal fluid. Here are two uh, examples, subject one and subject two, of how uh, an image would look like in the output. So on the left-hand column is the uh, uh, 10 degree image uh, of one B scan of each of these two subjects. Uh, second column is the manual segmentation. Uh, the red is the intraretinal fluid, the lavender will be the subretinal fluid. 
Um, and then the C is uh, the third column is the how the um, automated segmentation um, would have graded. And then D would be the uh, the last would be the uh, the map. And as you can see in the subject one um, is mostly intraretinal fluid, uh, very little. And so you don't see any lavender, uh, whereas uh, in the um, um, subject two, you have the distribution of the subretinal fluid as well as the uh, intraretinal fluid. And uh, I think this is really exciting. Um, we can use this longitudinally uh, to monitor a patient undergoing anti-VEGF therapy. Um, this is an 82-year-old uh, um, man who has wet AMD in the right eye and dry AMD in the left eye. He's been getting a flibercep injection um, to his right eye um, and then uh, somewhere along that uh, injection, um, uh, he, uh, we started imaging uh, the, uh, the subject with the uh, uh, home OCT device uh, at home um, uh, of this patient. So this is day zero, um, not too far after the uh, uh, anti-VEGF injection that he got. Vision is 2025. And um, what we see is uh, 18 uh, picoliters of fluid or so the, the machine tells us. I, I mean, it's really, really small that we probably would have just uh, glanced over, but the machine is able to uh, map that um, as a subretinal fluid. Uh, it's lavender, so it's a subretinal fluid. And then also you can see uh, the, the, the uh, graph there. Um, the patient uh, comes back um, uh, uh, 20 days after the baseline OCT, uh, or uh, the patient gets imaged 20 days after the baseline OCT, um, and um, there is now more fluid, 18 nanoliters, and it gets mapped uh, as subretinal fluid, um, as you see there. Uh, and then uh, four days after that, uh, it even goes up higher. Now there's 124 nanoliters uh, of uh, fluid. So at that point, the uh, um, patient was given a flibercep injection. And then four days after the injection, um, this is what we see. We see that the amount of fluid has gone down um, uh, to 45 nanoliters. So uh, we can see the treatment effect of uh, uh, the uh, flibercep uh, on this eye. And then um, um, day 42 from the baseline, uh, we see that there uh, continues to be an uh, improvement. So we can uh, follow how the patient does after uh, each injection. And when the fluid uh, comes back, uh, we can uh, detect that right away. Um, and uh, it might also uh, teach us um, the patterns of fluid distribution. Um, there is a thought that intraretinal fluid actually uh, is more harmful uh, than subretinal fluid and subretinal fluid may be uh, tolerated a little bit longer in some patients. We will know uh, for sure by doing more of these images, whether that is true or not. And we will also know uh, whether it's uh, how the fluid is changing, uh, how fast after an injection or, uh, um, uh, or how long since the last injection. Um, so, uh, and we can see how uh, uh, the eye does with maybe different drugs um, and these uh, fluid volume uh, can be uh, quantified as well. So uh, using an uh, AI algorithm, um, uh, it can help us to quantify and also it can help us to visualize the locations of the fluid and it has uh, potential to uh, monitor our patients uh, more easily and more accurately and in a more timely fashion and be able to uh, uh, detect the changes uh, for that patient each eye separately. The third point uh, for successful um, a home OCT system would be the low cost device with high resolution. Um, uh, as I said, it's a portable device, but um, uh, what I understand is that it will be sort of similar to the 4C home 
uh, model for the um, um, metamorphopsia detection uh, from the Notel company, uh, where it will be a rental basis rather than um, uh, selling the equipment to a patient or to a clinic. Um, it has uh, gained uh, FDA breakthrough designation and uh, currently uh, uh, is expected to be FDA approved sometime um, in the uh, first or second quarter of 2021. Finally, there should be an infrastructure to directly interact with and assist the patients. So this is all done at home. They just uh, uh, connect the machine to uh, their regular outlet. And um, there is this independent diagnostic testing facility uh, personnel who can help set it up remotely and uh, data gets analyzed. And if the patient is non-compliant with their machine, uh, they can be called upon uh, and uh, assisted. And the images uh, uh, are viewable uh, by the physicians. So you can decide uh, whether the patient is doing well or not. Um, and you can look at the images uh, for yourself. Uh, and in fact, in order to get paid, you need to uh, review it at least once a month. And if a patient uh, has a fluid accumulation above a certain level, uh, you'll get alerted it, and then uh, your office will call the patient to schedule to come in. So that is sort of the scheme uh, that uh, may be what's going to happen. Um, obviously, we're, uh, we can always think about and improve this process as well. I'm sure uh, uh, they'll be happy to uh, hear what other uh, bright people uh, think about this. But in my opinion, having a home OCT diagnostic testing uh, gives us an opportunity to uh, personalize um, um, uh, wet AMD management and maybe eventually a diabetes, a diabetic macular edema, uh, RVO management as well, because we can catch uh, the recurrence uh, as soon as it happens. And also it might give us the inter-visit disease knowledge to see when and how much the fluid accumulates and where in a retina or under the retina. One of the reasons why our patients in the real world don't do as well uh, visually uh, compared to the clinical trials is that uh, many of them are under-treated. They, they don't get as many treatments as they did in clinical trial, or perhaps we're not catching them in a timely fashion. So it is possible that with this personalized wet MD management, we can get better visual acuity outcome. But more importantly, I think it may decrease treatment burden because if they're called to come in, it's because they know that it, they have fluid reaccumulation. So some patients may need to come in more often, but they know they have to come in because they need a shot. While others, they may be able to go uh, weeks or even months without needing to come in and will need to come in only if uh, fluid accumulates or I'm thinking maybe every six months so that uh, if uh, the other eye has uh, uh, issues, uh, or if we want to see dilated fundus examination um, uh, to detect uh, hemorrhage, um, which is, as you know, not very good with OCT, uh, that we might be able to uh, uh, at least to, to additional um, get additional um, surveillance. So uh, doing home OCT, in my opinion, does not mean that the patient never comes in unless there's a, um, a alert. I think you can customize how often they come in as well. And I think the home OCT is an uh, adjunctive to what you wanna do. And finally, I think it's really exciting right now because everybody's talking about how to make our anti-VEGF and other treatments longer, last longer. I mean, that's why BioView uh, was approved, right? Um, so as we go to other treatment therapies like PDS, which may last six months uh, or gene therapy, uh, which may last forever, um, you know, these uh, monitoring um, may be even more important to know which of that 50% will need to come in sooner and which one uh, doesn't need to come in as soon, uh, et cetera, for instance. And as different drug treatments are being tested, we might be able to use this in clinical trials so that we don't have to do a two-year study. We might you know, be able to know sooner whether this drug is working or not. Um, so that we may be able to uh, decrease the cost and maybe accelerate the drug development. So thank you very much. Uh, I will take a, a, a question and answer for this section at this time before I go on. 
Great, Judy. Thanks. That's, I mean, I, I think we're all looking forward to this um, at some point uh, uh, to decrease the treatment burden or the travel, as you say, in some way, shape or form. Um, does anybody have any questions for her? Judy, this is Rajiv. That's a great presentation. Uh, what, what is um, uh, going on with uh, insurance reimbursement for this? Uh, is this something that CMS is looking at? Thank you, Rajiv. That's a great question because, uh, you know, if we have a great machine, but it doesn't get uh, uh, paid for uh, for the patient, it might not have an uptake. Uh, fortunately, there, uh, the, the uh, company was able to get, get an um, um, code um, um, for this, for billing. Um, uh, and also, Another thing is uh, that uh, the physicians can get paid for reviewing the images. Uh, one of the issues, uh, some people think why the 4T home was not uptaken readily was uh, the, the physicians felt left out, uh, both in terms of uh, understanding what the uh, threshold or the, uh, the alert meant, uh, and, and there were a lot of fraud, perhaps some false positivity, and there was no um, uh, uh, financial uh, incentive to uh, uh, prescribe it. Um, but uh, this one uh, will uh, have a CPT code and uh, uh, billing uh, ability, and this uh, uh, will be uh, uh, covered by Medicare. Um, again, it will be a um, CMS by CMS and different se sections of the uh, country, but uh, that is the plan. Thank you. Is there a rollout date or is there uh, when they're considering the mass distribution or availability? So um, it needs to be FDA approved first. And our current thought is that it will be around the first or second quarter of um, uh, 2021. Um, you know, like every clinical trial um, because of uh, the pandemic, a lot of things uh, became um, uh, somewhat delayed. Um, um, I don't know about you guys, but uh, we've had a hard time getting any uh, uh, clinical trials uh, up and running again. Um, so um, um, uh, that has been a little bit of a, a downside. And also, you know, so much of FDA and everybody else have been you know, concentrating on the uh, pandemic uh, yeah. and rightfully so. Um, so it, it got a little bit delayed, but uh, the hope is that uh, in 2021, we will start seeing it uh, rolled out. And again, uh, this will be um, uh, prescribed to the patient and then it will be sent to the patient's home. Um, you know, I, I, I talked to them about maybe having it in our clinics. Um, maybe it's sort of a poor man's version of OCT in every clinic room so that patients don't have to go to our photography and get clogged down there. Um, who knows uh, in the future what uh, uh, it might look like, but at least not at this current time. Um, so, it'll be is there training? I'm sorry. Do they send it straight to their home, or do you train? How's the training go for the patient? So, uh, as uh, it was done in the uh, uh, clinical trial, um, uh, they will have a video okay. um, that will be sent to them, and uh, they will learn from that. Okay. And there will also be uh, uh, over the um, phone uh, or over uh, the uh, internet um, uh, assistance from the. Uh, uh, the facility um, uh, monitoring center. Um, so a lot of these, uh, uh, there will be. Um, so I'll just uh, uh, quickly go over the second one. It, it's actually a sort of a sweet one that's uh, uh, got a couple of uh, pearls for the clinicians. Um, uh, uh, with these imaging studies, nothing happens in vacuum. Got lots of collaborators and uh, had the fun of uh, collaborating with also and mentoring lots of medical students over time. So uh, it's always exciting to do research. Um, so let's start with what I've learned uh, with some of the imaging uh, um, after macular hole surgery and then followed by epiretinal membrane surgery. Uh, Macular hole closure, as we talked about uh, with excellent case presentations, is quite successful in uh, closing the hole. 
but not all patients uh, improve vision. Um, and um, sometimes metamorphopsia um, persists, even though anatomically it looks great. Um, what I've learned is that not all patients have perfect uh, OCT after uh, uh, a successful hole closure, what we call successful hole closure. There's usually this um, uh, ellipsoid zone um, abnormality and sometimes even external limiting membrane abnormality. And um, other studies on OCT and macular holes have uh, shown that uh, ellipsoid zone defects were common um, after um, macular hole surgery. And uh, this may be an important biomarker um, in the future uh, as we look at um, the uh, images. Um, and what we also learn is that uh, if we just look at the OCT, lateral resolution of OCT is limited. Um, so we decided that uh, we could use maybe adaptive optics. And I'm not going to go over adaptive optics to you guys because uh, you all are the mecca of uh, adaptive optics. And you guys could teach me uh, rather than me teaching you. But um, what we uh, wanted to do was assess the foveal uh, photoreceptor structure uh, using AO and uh, OCT after the whole repair. Um, it was a prospective case series with uh, 13 eyes uh, of 12 subjects. Um, uh, these uh, patients were imaged mean of uh, six months. However, in three eyes of three subjects, uh, we had a extended follow-up um, uh, mean of 15 months, ranging from 12 to 17 months. And um, I will um, present to you these three cases. So first um, patient, three months after surgery, vision has improved from 2400 to 2050. But you could see on OCT, there is that easy disruption um, despite um, uh, whole closure. And what does the OC, uh, uh, adaptive optics look like? Um, we see that there is some abnormality in the uh, mosaicism of the uh, foveola. Um, um, and this is uh, obviously on image. Um, but uh, 17 months after surgery, what we uh, know from the OCT is that there is a reparative process that has gone um, uh, into uh, repair of the uh, ellipsoid zone. Um, and vision has improved, a um, couple more lines. What is uh, also remarkable is that um, on adaptive optics, there is uh, further improvement of the uh, mosaicism at the uh, foveola. Uh, it's not perfect, but definitely improved compared to three months uh, after surgery. This is a second patient, again, with easy disruption. Um, this patient uh, looks a lot like the first patient, but vision is 2080. Uh, AO uh, shows uh, more dark areas rather than the bright cones that we normally see. Um, um, but 12 months uh, after surgery, vision has improved to 2030, improvement in the EZ and maybe even the IZ, uh, ellipsoids and, and interdigitation zone. Um, and the uh, AO uh, shows a lot more um, uh, cones uh, uh, and uh, more filling. Uh, the mosaicism looks more um, um, normal there, although there are still some um, dark areas. And when we looked at various areas uh, near the center, um, the cone um, density um, it did not change between month three and 12 months or month three and 15 months. Um, so it's not like cells are migrating through the membranes, uh, but actually at the very center, um, there is a um, re-establishment uh, of cone um, and um, um, photoreceptor um, um, repair going on. And as Jess Nice, Jesse Nice spoke about the split detection, um, Alfred Dubra, when he was at um, uh, Medical College of Wisconsin, he developed it with his uh, graduate students and postdoc. And um, um, uh, we used split detector 
uh, OC, uh, a, adaptive optics uh, to study some of these patients as well. So here's a patient before surgery, uh, full thickness macular hole, vision of 2080. Uh, two years after surgery, the hole is still closed, vision is 2025. However, on uh, um, OCT, we do see mild irregularities at the ellipsoid zone as well as the interdigitation zone. And the ONFAS OCT um, does uh, uh, show easy defects um, at the phobia. So with the standard confocal um, AO, um, there are areas of uh, bright cones and dark areas. So what's going on? When we um, did a split detection AO, we see that uh, it does light up, that there are um, uh, uh, cone uh, segments. Um, so they are present, but are not uh, aligned well or are not uh, waveguiding or they're uh, missing some uh, uh, outer segments maybe. So um, the bottom line is that with split detection AO, we can see more and perhaps this patient, uh, we can see that they can, they may continue to improve over time because we don't have uh, uh, dark area, even with the split detection AO. Um, obviously, it's a small number, um, and uh, imaging uh, at the foveola is quite difficult, um, um, but uh, um, uh, we do have AO that can do that, but uh, there is quite a bit of variability um, in the imaging quality uh, among these patients. Um, we learned that uh, there is significant photoreceptor disruption following macular hole closure, even though vision um, improves. And maybe that's why patients still uh, complain about metamorphosia, even though as surgeons we say, uh, look at this OCT, your hole is closed, your vision is better. But the patient may say, I still have metamorphosia. Um, and, um, the best thing uh, that I've learned uh, with this study is that it may take time um, for this remodeling to go on and it may continue even uh, one to two years after the uh, surgery. So I could actually give our patients some um, um, hope that uh, perhaps the metamorphosia will improve uh, with the improvement in the uh, photoreceptor anatomy. Um, or they may get used to it uh, as our brain <laughs> gets used to them. Um, but um, um, I, I think it's interesting to uh, see that um, um, uh, the repair process is not immediate uh, and may go on for some time. And briefly with the uh, uh, epiretinal membrane, um, uh, we looked at foveal contour. Why? Because I was getting a lot of uh, uh, referrals from uh, cataract surgeons uh, with the referring diagnosis of uh, rule out cystomacular edema after um, cataract surgery. Well, it turns out many had uh, this commonality. These patients all had history of epiretinal membrane and had vitrectomy for their epiretinal membrane. And then they progressed in their cataract formation. Um, so they end up getting cataract extraction. And then the referring doc, just the cataract surgeon does an OCT and uh, sees that uh, there is no foveal contour and it's thickened. Um, so there must be CME, so it, must, uh, it may need to be treated. So that's usually the scenario, how I get uh, these patients. So it made me wonder um, that despite successful uh, and uh, complete membrane removal at the macula, and uh, the vision improves, um, that foveal depression doesn't seem to come back uh, all the time. So how often would it come back? Well, um, a word about epiretinal membrane, um, it's gotten, it's made out of a lot of different types of cells and they um, um, undergo a metamorphosis and then they uh, con contract and cause a foveal contour loss. And then sometimes if the con contraction is bad enough, they can cause ellipsoid zone disruption at baseline as seen in this patient um, on the right uh, with the ERM um, and then uh, uh, 
easy disruption if the fovea and the retina is thickened. So our question um, that we asked was, how often does the foveal depression return um, after successful year removal? If we start out with no foveal depression. Um, so this was a, um, a retrospective chart review of 80 consecutive eyes that went through uh, the testimony surgery with 23 gauge. Uh, I was using Indosign in green at the time. Um, uh, and um, uh, we looked at the pre and post op OCT. In order to do this, uh, we developed a quantitative grading um, system. Uh, and we called grade zero if there is a, a dip in the middle uh, and uh, there was a, a thinning compared at the foveal center compared to one millimeter um, uh, of the retina either side of the uh, foveola. And if it's uh, less than 92%, we said grade zero. Um, and it, you could also just eyeball and draw a straight line if there's, there's a dip, it's grade zero. If it's flat or within 92 to 180% of the one millimeter uh, either side, um, then we call it grade one. And if it was uh, greater than 108% thickness at foveal center compared to the either side, then we call that grade two. Um, what we found was that uh, when we combined zero and one uh, and uh, two separately, when we looked at these uh, two different groups, uh, both groups improve uh, foveal uh, um, thickness um, after surgery. Also, both groups improved vision after um, um, vitrectomy and removal of epiurinal membrane. About foveal contour, how does it change? Well, uh, out of the uh, 80 eyes, um, there were 19 that ended up with grade zero after surgery. So that meant 24% uh, ended up with uh, foveal depression uh, by our definition. Um, but if we only look at uh, the eyes uh, that um, started out without um, foveal depression uh, preoperatively uh, and ended up with foveal depression postoperatively, 21% uh, uh, ended up with foveal depression. Um, so what did we find? It meant that preoperative grade, um, whether they had foveal depression or not, did not um, uh, predict the final postoperative grade, but there was a trend towards uh, those having foveal depression pre-op, staying with foveal depression, ending up with foveal depression, and those with uh, elevated fovea um, 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 ended up uh, with elevated fovea. And grade one, uh, somewhere in between, they, they either actually got worse or got better. Um, so to um, uh, wrap up here, how often does the foveal depression return following surgery? Um, only about 20%. Um, um, so that's if you start without foveal depression. So if you do a lot of grade zero eyes, uh, then you will have more. But in, in my case, I tend to do when they're grade zero or two. So um, um, uh, this is what we get. However, um, um, not getting foveal depression after surgery did not necessarily uh, uh, give a bad visual outcome because uh, as a group, um, uh, all groups improved visual acuity. And um, uh, what we can say is that um, like other studies, we found that favorable for post-op foveal contours are not related to visual acuity outcomes, meaning you don't have to get foveal depression to get vision improvement. You could stay thicken and still get visual improvement. Um, and our study was limited to four months, uh, uh, but uh, perhaps it can change uh, over time, just like macro hole, it can continue to uh, improve. But uh, uh, in a uh, other part of the study that is not gonna be shown here, we saw most of the improvement by uh, month three or four. So that's where we stopped. So, um, what uh, I tell my patients is that just because you don't get foveal depression, that doesn't mean that you're not going to improve vision. And the most important thing, I think the reason why I started this study is that for cataract surgeons, um, 
following after I remember surgery, not everybody will get phobia depression. So having the thickening should not be confused with cystic macular edema. Um, they should have some uh, intraretinal fluid before they should be referred to the retina specialist. And this is just a little uh, tidbit of what I'm thinking right now. Um, I'm, I, I, I'm thinking this is sort of akin to a rubber band. If you uh, stretch uh, the rubber band uh, uh, hard enough and long enough uh, and let go, you don't always get it all back to the pre-stretched uh, rubber band uh, length that you will end up with somewhere in between. Uh, likewise with balloons, if you uh, stretch it and then let it go uh, after a while of uh, being inflated, it doesn't always get to this uh, initial baseline size and volume. Um, so. Um, perhaps we can think about retina um, um, with swelling, um, um, like in the macular edema, cystic macular edema, diabetic macular edema. Or we can think about thickening, um, um, but also we might all think about stretching. Perhaps the Mueller cells get stretched and they never um, get back to the original uh, contour and the, uh, the back to their uh, uh, elasticity um, after a while. So thank you. Happy holidays, everyone. Thanks, Judy. That's great. I I always considered chronicity a big part of that because I, I thought that a lot of the, this may not be right, but I thought a lot of the thickening was due to increased glial cell density from the chronic irritation from that stretching effect so that you actually would have proliferation of astrocytes and or Mueller cells that would lead to that increased density. So that's why you didn't get necessarily decreased thickness for these chronic ERMs. I don't know if our AO people could tease that out, and, <laughs> but it would be an interesting thing to find out. Yeah, it'll be interesting. So maybe, uh, David, uh, you know, it may be a combination uh, yeah. of the two. So the cells are stretched, but also filled in with astrocytes and other proliferation. So that gives you a thickening. Um, um, so maybe it's a combination of a stretching and thickening. Yeah. Be very interesting. And you're right. Maybe uh, AO may be the way to look at it or... Uh, other ways as our imaging uh, becomes more sensitive. Yeah, but I agree. I actually have had that exact same experience with um, practitioners. Um, and I've seen, you know, other docs treat and treat and treat and treat this with steroids and drops and everything else and, and not realizing that this, you know, is not an uncommon result of a membrane peel. And I think you, uh, David, I uh, hit it right on the head there. Um, I've had patients uh, uh, get injected because, yeah. you know, general ophthalmologists are now doing injections as well. Um, so um, I, I think it's important for all of us to be able to uh, um, look at the images and interpret it correctly so the patients don't get uh, unnecessary treatment. Absolutely. Uh, as, you know, um, some of these treatments are uh, not without Bye, Definitely. So, Dr. Kim, I, I really liked the uh, the presentation and uh, enjoyed the case report that that you had published. I think it was in 2016 on the macular hole repair, and then imaged with AO. I think that's the perfect application for the technology because you know exactly where to look uh, pre and post surgery uh, with high resolution. Um, I, I did have one question. When you talk about the remodeling that's happening there uh, over time, it's probably speculation on your part, but could you, could you walk me through, do you think that that's an active process? Is this like active remodeling or do you consider it more of a mechanical remodeling process? Well, it's uh, speculation, and uh, Jesse, you may be uh, better at uh, uh, answering that uh, if uh, now that you know AO imaging you know, continues to improve. I mean, one of the reasons why we couldn't do this uh, study previously was because we couldn't image full viola with adaptive optics very well. But as the machine got better and we were able to image the uh, full viola, 
that's when we said, ah, maybe we can do this study uh, after all, because uh, I've been wanting to do this for a long, long, long time. <laughs> um, um, so, I, you know, and, and we were um, uh, doing most of our study with the, uh, the, the conventional um, um, the confocal AO, um, and split detection came later. Um, so we didn't image all of the patients with split detection. So that could have given us a little more insight. Um, but I think it's a combination. Um, uh, perhaps um, uh, if the the fact that there is external limiting membrane uh, seen on OCT makes me think that uh, um, the inner segments are viable, and maybe it's the outer segment that um, um, are either um, damaged and needs to be regenerated, or um, they're not wave guiding because they're not interjudicating. Um, uh, crackly uh, appropriately to the uh, RTE uh, layer and not wave guided. Fantastic, thank you. So I, yeah, I, I, I do think there's a continuous uh, remodeling um, going on as long as um, um, the inner segment is um, viable. So that's one of the reasons why we may want to do these surgeries sooner before too much of the cones get damaged. Yeah, and I, I think that highlight, that spot that you highlight in the in the subfovial area where you start to get that disruption, that little buildup of, I don't know what that material is, but that spot, um, that's really the, the time to intervene because you can have that membrane for a long time and not it can look bad, but it, the photoreceptors really aren't disrupted until you start seeing that develop over time. So in the uh, uh, epirenal membrane and in uh, cases of macular hole, uh, as you said, uh, we do see sometimes these uh, subretinal deposits, and I think those are shed outer segments. Um, uh, and, I, and I only say that because sometimes when you do a auto, fundus autofluorescence, uh, they hyperfluoresce. Um, so I think uh, those are um, shed hour segments, and I think that's the same um, in cases with central serous chorioretinopathy. Um, uh, you see elongation of the outer segments, uh, and then eventually uh, loss, and uh, you, you see some um, 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 garbage <laughs> or deposits um, uh, on top of the RTE, uh, and they can autofluoresce. That's great, Judy. I Thank you for taking the time and, um, with us this afternoon. I really appreciate it. There's some nice overlap here between Wisconsin and, and Rochester with the adaptive optics imaging. I, thanks for highlighting what you're doing there. Um, it was very much appreciated. Um, and I just wanted to share my screen here um, to finish up. And I will stop share. There you go. Thank you. This, let's see. Continue and uh, I just want to remind everybody, thanks for joining us. And again, look for your email Monday or Tuesday regarding the CME credits. And just a reminder for the upcoming educational events, we're not having a formal ground rounds next January, but there is a basic science talk from the clinician scientist, Lynn Hasman, who was an ex-resident here. Now she's an assistant professor uh, at WashU, and she'll be talking about single cell investigation into UVI, uveitis pathogenesis from bench to bedside. And then the next official grounds rounds will be on February 19th. We'll be highlighting pediatric ophthalmology with our visiting professor, Laura and Yeti, and the basic science, science spotlight will be by our own Dun Young Yoon with his subject to be announced. And then in March, uh, we'll forego ground rounds for our uh, Rochester Ophthalmology Conference. Uh, with, we have um, guest speakers here, uh, David Huang and Steve, who's coming from Harvard? Cornea? Uh, Riza Dana. Ray Zadena is coming as well as one of our highlighted speakers. So I hope you all can join us for the next several months. It was a pleasure seeing you all today, albeit virtually. Judy, is great seeing you. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you. Everybody have a great weekend.